All right, everyone, welcome back. We're today we're going to be talking about free will and determinism. This is part of the issues and debates chapter. Here's an overview of the larger context in which we are navigating. We have already talked about gender and culture and psychology. If you haven't done so, you can click in the top right corner to see those videos. And now we're going to be talking about free will and determinism. And we've got a bunch of um, topics still ahead. So go check those out as they get uploaded. This is a very cheeky and funny message I got from one of my students who said, Good morning, sir. I didn't come to your lesson first period because I woke up late. So I'm very sorry. However, this isn't my fault because as you mentioned on Wednesday, we have no free will. So this has nothing to do with me and I tried my best. Thank you for your attention. So <laughs> what she is um, getting at is that, well, maybe if there is no free will, then we cannot be held accountable for any of the decisions we make because those decisions have already been set in stone and there is no way of changing those. So everything's going to play out the way it's supposed to. Another weird way of saying is that there's something called fate or um, and that yeah, any, anything in your life has been set and you're just going to live through that life as an observer, as a passive observer, um, thinking that some decisions might happen. You, you might be making free decisions, but in reality, there was no other way of you making those decisions. So everything's playing out as it should. And so that's just today's discussion, free will versus determinism. Who is right? So let's talk about those two phrases, free will and determinism. Now, imagine I um, play chess and I'm moving a piece across the board. And you could say, well, I can predict which um, which piece that person's going to move. And sometimes the, the next move is very obvious because it's very clearly the best move, right? But who knows? I mean, that person might actually just, you know, stand up and walk away. You know, who's to say that, that not, that's not going to happen or that they're going to make a complete mistake and do another move that, um, that was completely unpredictable, right? Similarly, un unlike in physics, for example, if you throw a ball and you know exactly the the angle and the mass of the ball and the, um, the the force with which it was thrown, then you can predict exactly where that ball is going to land, right? And you can do it again and again. You can always predict it correctly. But with human behavior, we can't seem to be able to predict accurately what a person will do. And so that's why some proponents in psychology say that humans have free will, that they are able to, in the moment, make a decision for or against something, and there's no telling from the outside what that decision will be. That stands in contrast to people that believe in determinism. The idea being here, if you know all the factors that can influence a person, then you can predict exactly what they're going to do. Right? So we know that people can be influenced. Think of social influence. The per people around us influence our decisions. So there is some form of influence. We can predict human behavior to a certain degree. Maybe we can't do it 100% because we don't know all the factors. But if we know every single factor, we should be able to predict human behavior perfectly. Right? So right now we can't do that. But that's the debate. To what extent are we free to make our own decisions? And to what extent are we bound by the environment or even our genetics um, in, in terms of what our decisions will be? Now, if we look at the approaches in psychology, you have the humanistic approach standing alone, believing that humans have a free um, have have free will and uh, that are able to make their own decisions, while all the other ones clump around the idea that actually there are factors that influence our, our behavior and dictate our behavior. But they all come from different, they all focus on different things, right? The biologists would say it's the hormones um, in our body or our genetics. The cognitive people would say actually it's the way our brain is built that allows us to only think and act in a certain way. Or the social approach would be, well, it's it depends on the kinds of friends and the kinds of parents you have that makes you who you are and what kind of decisions you're going to make. And they're all right. I mean, they all these all factors all have an influence on us, right? But they are not able to predict human behavior 100% correct. And therefore, as long as that's the case, there still is a chance that free will might actually exist. Before going on, we need to understand the difference between hard and soft determinism. Say there's a criminal who commits a crime, let's say they're stealing something, and um, and let's let's look at how these two approaches would 
see that situation differently. The hard determinism school would say it's not their fault. The reason why they stole is because a lot of factors that influence their lives. Maybe they are going through some hard times. Maybe they had friends that influenced them and said, you know, you should steal or... Um, so what I'm saying is that if you know all the factors, you can predict that somebody's going to, um, to steal and it's not their fault. They didn't have a choice. They had to steal because there was just no other outcome. All the factors in their life made them reach that point in their life where they're going to steal. Therefore, they cannot be held accountable for their crimes, actually. If you go all the way and say, you know what? This person was just unlucky, got born into the wrong life circumstances. That's why they stole. Soft determinism, on the other hand, says, well, yeah, there are factors. We don't deny that, yeah? But still, in the end, the person still has a choice in that moment to steal or not to steal, okay? And so... Um, different kinds of psychological approaches lean more towards hard determinism and soft determinism. We're going to look at that later. All right, there are going to be three types of determinism we're going to talk about. Biological determinism, environmental determinism, and psychic determinism. Biological determinism is an easy one. Genes, hormones, the autonomous nervous system. Say you jump off a bridge, uh, you do bungee jumping, what's going to happen? Well, you are going to get a lot of adrenaline uh, running through your um, veins and your heart's going to pound and you're going to start sweating. You might probably going to um, scream and all of that is very predictable. I mean, the chance that somebody's not going to react like that when they jump off a bridge is very unlikely, right? So there is some kind of, we are bound by our biology. There is nothing we can do against our biology. We will, in many situations, re react very predictably, like that person jumping off a bridge, right? So that is biological determinism. What does environmental determinism say? The idea here being is that the environment around us influence our, our behavior. So for example, if we are taught from a young age that we should brush our teeth every night, then we will automatically start doing that even then, even when our parents are not there anymore and we live by ourselves and we find ourselves in the same routine, right? And so we can predict that a person will brush their teeth every night um, if they were influenced by their environment in a certain way, okay? Psychic determinism is quite interesting. So the idea being here that we first have to separate the conscious mind from the unconscious mind. And the idea is that in our unconscious mind, there are wants and needs that, um, that then sometimes bubble up into our consciousness. And we um, are influenced by our unconscious mind without us even noticing. And sometimes they do become apparent. There's this example that, that um, we like to use. Um, David Cameron, the former prime minister of the United Kingdom, said um, when he won the 7th of May election, he said a career defining, um, as a, the election was career defining. But what he actually meant to say was country defining. And, okay? and so what people were saying is that actually um, his subconscious mind, which really, really wanted to win so that it, because it was, would be good for his career, actually came out in terms of verbal language when he meant to say country defining, but his unconscious mind said, uh, put the career defining words in his mouth. Okay. Um, so that's kind of says here that it's, um, his opponent said that it's intentionally revealing that he was more concerned about his own job prospects than the future of the UK. Okay, so that's a funny an a anecdote to show the link between our unconscious mind that influence our conscious mind, making us, um, influencing us, therefore leaning more towards the deterministic side. So let's look at some evaluation. The first point I want to make is that we don't have an answer to the question, what is more true, free will or determinism, right? As long as determinism approaches cannot prove, cannot predict human behavior to 100% certainty, we don't know if free will really doesn't exist, okay? But we can make some practical applications of this. Roberts et al. from the year 20, uh, 2000 um, made a study with adolescents and showed that people, adolescents who believe in determinism, meaning that their lives was decided for them already, they were at a greater risk of developing depression. The idea being here, 
linking this to locus of control, if you think that you have the agency and control over the decisions in your life, you're going to be more optimistic. And that makes absolutely sense, doesn't it? If you think that your life is set in stone and things are going to happen the way they're supposed to and there's nothing you can do about it, you might become depressed. But if you feel like you have the power to be to take your own life into your own hands and shape it and mold in yourself and your life into what you want it to be, well, then that's very empowering. That gives you a sense of control in your life and therefore it makes you feel good about yourself. Okay. Now, the meat of the evaluation in this chapter is this one. Libé et al. 1983. This is a really cool study. And I highly encourage you to watch this, um, this summary of the of the study online. I'm going to leave the link in the video description below, but you can also see it in the in the lesson slides, which you can also access underneath the video. Now, Libé made this fascinating experiment where he was measuring the brain activity of patients. And he was asking them, at a random point in time, please press this button. Okay, so they were just sitting there, getting their brain waves measured. And at some point, they would have to make a decision to press a button. And that was up to them when to press that button, okay? The cool thing is that Libé was able to predict one second before people press the button and made a decision to press the button when they're gonna press the button, okay? So kind of they would probably see some kind of spike in the brain activity and say, ah, in the next second, they're gonna press the button and they did press the button. Fascinating, uh, fascinating study. And there were other people that made other studies with uh, functional medic magnetic resonance imaging um, um, tools that um, stretched this out even further. And they could go, go out um, by 10 seconds, I believe, 10 seconds before people made a decision um, um, with a certain certainty whether people are going to press a button and when they're going to press a button. And there were even decisions where people had two different buttons and they could predict which button they're going to press. Okay. And so if you look at brain activity, there, to some degree, scientists can predict behavior before people are even aware. This is the key. Before people are aware they're going to make a decision, the scientists can already tell that a decision has been made and when it will be made. That's absolutely fascinating. And that is a, quite the big support uh, argument for determinism. So watch that video if you want to get into this more deeper. The counterpoint to Libé's experiment is this. Who's to say that free will only happens in consciousness? Okay, in other words, consciousness and free will don't have to go hand in hand. Couldn't it be possible that I make a free willed decision without being conscious of it? Now, that's very weird because we usually think of decision making as something that we actively do, that we are aware of making a decision, right? But what if we can make decisions without actually being aware of it? I mean, it's not impossible. It's, it's not an impossibility, okay? So we cannot say for certain that, that that is not a possibility, okay? So maybe when uh, Libé or other researchers are able to predict when a a participant is going to press a button and the participant doesn't even know they're going to press a button that doesn't rule out free will and that's it that's the argument okay that free will and consciousness don't necessarily have to go hand in hand it could also be that we make free will decisions in the unconscious mind Let's go back to this idea of criminals and the criminal justice system, right? I mean, we do we put people in prison to punish them for what they've done. But what if heart determinism is correct and we are just a product of our life circumstances? So the biologists would say, what if there are genes that make you more likely to commit a crime? Or environmental determinism would say, what if you had bad influences like parents that didn't teach you about right and wrong um, or that let you down or friends that got you into the wrong circles, right? So what if those factors alone define whether somebody's going to commit a crime or not? Wouldn't that mean if, if people didn't have a choice that they couldn't have done it the other, any other way. There was no way of a person who committed a crime to not have done the crime. It's impossible to them to not do a crime because of their life circumstances. If that is the case, why are we then punishing these people by putting them in prison, right? 
It's not their fault. That's the argument of hard determinism. And now you can have a philosophical discussion about, well, you know, we can't have these people on the street. They're going to commit more crime and the society is going to break down, right? And how are we ever going to improve ourselves if we don't go through some, some punishment stage like going through prison? And, and so hard determinism is definitely not accepted within the criminal justice system. If it were, then society as we know it would to a certain degree break down, right? Couldn't send people to prison anymore. And nobody, it would, nothing would ever be anybody's fault, right? A student could be in my class and say, well, the reason why I'm not paying attention is because of all these factors in my life and it's not my fault and I'm going to misbehave because I don't have a choice. Well, that doesn't work, right? We need to be able to feel like we can change things um, or else society wouldn't work. It's a very hard determinism is very unpractical. Right, let's get to the last point. The last point argues, well, if we put psychology on a more deterministic footing, so if we believe that humans are just a product of factors, then psychology would be more like a natural science. Okay, so up to this point, you have learned that human behavior is very unpredictable. You know, you get these results, 40% of participants did this and that, and 60% did this and that, and we can't tell who's going to do what, right? But what if we find laws, laws of human behavior, just like we have them in biology, chemistry, or physics, where the, that example with the ball, if you know F equals MA, the formula for the movement of an object, then you can predict exactly where a ball is going to land. But we don't have those laws for psychology right now. But if we accept, if we assume, or if we accept that humans are, um, don't have a free will and they act out of those factors that influence their lives, if we know all those factors, we could make psychology a natural science. So that's, that's the argument. So right now it is not, but maybe it will. If we look at the different approaches in psychology that we discuss, the only one that is not favoring determinism is the humanistic approach. The humanistic approach favors free will and says you are in control of your life, you can make your own decisions, um, while the other ones are just focusing on different aspects of factors that control. And, and that is the, the direction in which psychology is trying to push to. The question is just, are they going to make it? Are they going to be able to predict human behavior 100% or is free will going to prevail? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of this topic. I have one more thing that I want to share with you, which is this 20-minute presentation um, about free will and determinism. It is an absolutely fascinating um, talk that I highly recommend you watch. So go ahead and do that. Leave a like if you liked it and subscribe and hit the bell to get notified when I drop a new video. Download these and many more slides for free and consider supporting me on Patreon and get access to detailed mind maps and past paper revisions. If you're a teacher, get free access to ZenTeach, an online quizzing tool with ready-to-go multiple choice quizzes and automated feedback. Make sure to use the invite code, which is, like all links, in the video description below. Mm -hmm.